The Strange Men Anthology is probably one of my favorite RPG Maker horror series of all time. The stories and characters are incredible, with countless emotional and heavily impactful moments that I have yet to find in other games like this. They always have great morals about personal development and being there for others. From the Crooked Man starting the series with a moody tone, to the Sandman and its more lighthearted comedic side, to the Boogeyman which became the darkest and most depressing game in the series, Uri has thrown her hat into every ring, hitting the nail on the head each and every time. But every series has to come to an end eventually. Now before I can hop into the descriptions for the finale, I need to be entirely transparent with you. Many scenes are going to be heavily edited in this video. My video on the Crooked Man was age restricted, despite containing no offensive or harmful content. I would personally argue that it does the exact opposite of what YouTube claimed when it was reviewed, but there's nothing I can do about it now. The final game in the Strange Man anthology is the closest in subject matter to the Crooked Man, meaning there is a high likelihood that I will make no money from this video. I'm not even willing to risk saying the name of the game. Instead, I'm going to be referring to it as the finale. Because of this, I would really appreciate it if you'd consider checking out my Patreon. You can get your name at the end of videos, weekly updates, behind the scenes content, sponsor free releases, and access to a special section of my Discord server where I record and edit videos and voice chats. With that out of the way, let's talk about the game. The finale released in 2017 with predominantly snowy promotional artwork. This makes it stand out against the original three, which had mostly dark assets. Let's take a look at the plot summary from the official translator's website. A boy walks through the snow, wandering around town. After running from place to place, he ends up in an old, abandoned building in the woods. Though he hoped to leave soon, when his best friend runs away, he must face his trial and go in search of him. The plot of this game is heavily tied to the first three games in the series, so I would highly recommend you watch my videos on the previous entries before this one. All three will be linked in the description below. A young boy is trudging through the snow at night, completely alone. The only illuminated building is a nearby fishing shop, which the boy enters. I am so happy with the art style in this game. It's truly the best I've ever seen from RPG Maker. It's simple, but it's cohesive. The characters look distinct, the assets and environments have so much detail, and it's immediately recognizable. That combined with the character stills scattered throughout many of the cutscenes, and we have an incredible looking game. As the boy browses, the clerk notices him eyeing a specific rod on the wall and talks to him about it. But the boy ignores everything, throwing the rod to the floor and stomping it to pieces. The clerk and manager bring him to the back to try and get any information they can, but the boy remains completely silent. They retrieve a piece of paper with a phone number on it from his coat, assuming it to be his guardian and calling so he can get picked up. David Hoover shows up, immediately recognizing the boy as his cousin Will. He reimburses the manager for the merchandise before leaving and taking Will with him. He asks if Will's mother knows where he is, but gets no response. They head to David's house, where he fixes fixes some food for the boy. Will, still unwilling to talk, refuses to eat anything. David allows Will to sleep in his room while taking the couch for himself. Before Will leaves for bed, David requests that tomorrow they have a talk. Will walks upstairs. The second he closes the door behind him, a rat flops out of his coat and onto the floor. It begins to spin. Beak. The voice acting in this game is really hit or miss. Some of the characters knock it out of the park, like David, while others are really unpleasant like the rat here. I think a lot of the characters would have had improved performances if they just had better quality mics, pop filters, and projected more. Overall, it is an improvement from the last game. The rat, who we learn is named Pop, claims that David is going to be really mad tomorrow during their talk. Because of this, Will climbs out of the window, using a tree to lower himself down to the ground. Pop suggests that they find a motel for the night since it's freezing cold outside. When they find one, Will stares at the owner until he breaks down, handing over the keys to room 103. Will attempts to enter his room, but the chain is locked and someone is already inside. The voice is recognizable as Keith, who immediately realizes that Will is a runaway. Will closes the door, returning to the main office and getting a different key from the owner. Now in room 105, he and Pop watch some TV and wash up before getting some rest. The next morning, Pop suggests that Will apologize to David, but First, they decide to get some food. They head to a nearby cafe where Reagan of all people is behind the counter. She tells Will to take a seat wherever he wants, which he does. Soon, another familiar waitress appears asking if she's seen Will before. It's Sophie. What are she and Reagan doing working together? Will panics at the idea of being recognized, and he runs away immediately. He doesn't want to go back into town, running into the woods next to the freeway next to a sign labeling a restricted area. As he trudges further into the woods, he stumbles upon a huge, run-down building. It's unlabeled, but it's the only shelter nearby, so Will crawls through a vent in the wall to get inside. After doing so, Will snags a can of spray paint before stumbling into a chapel of sorts. There are many chairs as well as a confessional booth in the corner. One of the chairs is occupied by a sleeping homeless man. This entire time, Pop has been making stupid wisecracks that have been driving me up a wall. I hate him 
so much. He's needlessly annoying and has been nothing but a complete nuisance since he first appeared. Will heads into the confessional booth and decides to confess his sins. Pop doesn't agree with what Will says, claiming that he doesn't think that the boy did anything wrong. Unfortunately, we can't hear what Will is saying, so we just kind of have to leave it for now. Will stands up and turns around to leave, noticing that the homeless man from before appears to be standing outside of the booth, listening. He waits for the man to leave before exiting. Both Will and Pop are uncomfortable now and want to leave, but the vent that they used to enter is far too high up on the wall to reach from inside of the building. Further in, Will finds the front entrance to the facility, but it's locked tightly. A rough map of the place shows at least four different buildings connected to each other, but not nearly enough information to find another exit. For now, they explore. Will finds a key labeled Gate Number 1, as well as a map with more details about one of the buildings. These maps are sometimes helpful, but other times needlessly confusing. The map in this this game is huge. It's equally as confusing as the mansion in The Boogeyman, and the perspective changes constantly. The finale still has the classic Uri formatting issues. You'll constantly move upwards through a door, but exit it downwards on the other side. This was a huge issue in some of the other games, especially when it came to chases, and it hasn't changed at all here. There's one specific scene later on which created a ton of needless confusion with the perspectives, but I'll address that once we get to it later. Will continues to look around, finding a key labeled Visiting Room 3. It has a tag attached to it reading Arkin. He also finds a dusty notebook to look through later. Down the hallway is a really good example of the perspective changes getting confusing. Here on the map, you can see that there's a visiting room to the north, then a left turn that leads to the dining room. When you walk there yourself, the camera fully rotates, with this hallway being horizontal instead of vertical. This isn't too much of a deal during normal gameplay, but it's downright malicious when trying to read the map during chases, which is a thing you'll have to do. Will heads into the dining room, then the kitchen, spotting a key inside of a locked elevator shaft. His arms aren't long enough to reach it, so he decides to keep it in mind for later and move on. As he moves towards the door, he hears footsteps from down the hallway, quickly hiding behind some shelves. The door opens, revealing Keith with a flashlight. He recognizes Will as the runaway from yesterday, asking why he isn't in school. Keith forces Will to come with him and leave the restricted area, but not before sharing a ghost story to keep the boy away from this building. He tells a story about five people dying in this very establishment 15 years ago. They haunt this building, with those who visit it hearing cries and seeing moving shadows. They were tied to the ceiling from their ankles, with their stomachs split, draining the blood through gravity. Keith whips his flashlight over to some dirty sacks suspended from the ceiling, successfully scaring Will. Unfortunately for Keith, he scared off Pop as well, and Will refuses to leave the establishment without his friend. He demands that Keith help him look for Pop, which Keith refuses to do. Keith makes a really stupid decision here, telling Will that he's allowed to stay and look for Pop, but that he immediately has to leave afterwards. He then just leaves the kid behind without having any way of verifying that Will is actually leaving after he finds Pop. Will heads upstairs, finding rows and rows of cells, floor after floor. He keeps walking up the stairs and finding himself on the same exact floor with the same exact stain. He grabs his can of spray paint, marking the stain and breaking the loop now that there's a clear way to verify which floor he's on. Will heads further up, finding a room with a note addressing someone named Alec. The author is never going to be able to meet him again. They tell him that in one week, they will visit him for the final time. In the rightmost seat of the visiting room, two knives will be placed underneath the table. Alec is to take it in secret. If he fails, someone named Arkin will bring the other one to him. Arkin is the name on the key to the third visiting room, indicating where the knife can be found. Will enters the visiting room, moving to the far left side because the person who wrote the note would have had a flipped perspective from the other side of the glass. Will grabs the extra knife, putting it in his bag. His eyes glance over a note that he keeps with him, reading, You're a demon child. Someday, you'll be burning in hell for your sins. With the rest of the hallway being a dead end, Will returns to the cell block, stumbling upon a newspaper sitting in the hallway. It appears that this building is a mental asylum, and Alec used that knife on himself. The article claims that a staff member helped them out, most likely this Arkin person. On one of the floors above him, Will hears a distant crying. He follows the sound, finding a message on the wall claiming that there's a monster trying to force someone, presumably the cell owner, out. Upon further exploration, Will finds Pop skittering about. The rat scrambles underneath a door that's been painted over with concrete, sealing it from most sides. Will moves to the cell to the left, locating a hole in the wall and climbing through in the hopes of finding Pop. Inside, he does, but Pop isn't alone. He's with the sleeping homeless man from earlier. The man introduces himself as Ed, and he seems like a relatively nice guy. When Will tells him that Pop can talk, Ed doesn't even bat an eye. Supposedly, he has a home that he can't go back to for one reason or another, so he's temporarily seeking some shelter 
Doctor at the asylum. He can't leave yet because he supposedly has something left to do here, although he won't elaborate on what it is. During this conversation, Pop gets scared and runs away again. Ed says that he can't help Will look because he's searching for something already, a black notebook. Ed and Will agree to keep an eye out for both the notebook and Pop before parting ways. Will keeps exploring, discovering a new floor. There's a second map for building one on the wall. It documents five floors of cells alongside a final floor with two exam rooms and a back room of some kind. One of the doors to the exam rooms opens on its own and Will decides to investigate. There isn't much of interest inside. The exam rooms are formatted almost like interrogation rooms with one-way mirrors that function as glass from the other direction. Will takes a look through the glass, noticing a reflection behind him of a tall, shadowy figure with blood-red eyes, tears pouring from each. With that, Will passes out. We're taken to a flashback from Will's childhood. Every night, when his mother would tuck him into bed and turn off the lights, a man in a striped shirt would appear. He would say nothing. He would do nothing. He would just sit there, in a way that Will equates to a mime. Whenever the lights turn back on, the mime vanishes. Will wakes up, finding that his coat has been placed atop him like a blanket. Keith is at a nearby table, sifting through some files. Keith addresses Will by his full name, William Morton, as he left his student ID inside of his jacket. Keith wants to know why Will skipped school and traveled so far to an abandoned building. He's only 14 years old. He also wants to know exactly why Will had a piece of paper on him with David Hoover's contact information on it. Will tells Keith that David is his cousin, which leaves only one more question. What What's the story behind the letter calling Will a demon child? Is he being threatened? Will says that he doesn't think he's being threatened, but refuses to elaborate any further. Will asks Keith how he knows David, to which the man claims that he and David drink together sometimes. With the conversation over, Keith tells Will to go off and search for his rat. Whenever Will is with Pop, he feels safer. Whenever he listens to Pop, it seems like everything will turn out okay in the end. Keith doesn't even entertain the idea of a rat being able to speak. Will is clearly scared because his friend is gone, so Keith asks if Pop has any identifying features. After learning that he has a bent right leg and some missing fur in that area, he promises to keep an eye out for Pop before starting to leave. Before Keith can exit the room, Will asks who he is, learning both his name and his profession as a detective. Will asks why he's here as well, but he doesn't get an answer. He begins shuffling through the detective's bag, locating a photo of the building labeled with the line, All the years you suffered, those were the best years of your life, George Schmidt. Keith tells Will to get his grubby little fingers off his bag. Is Keith investigating a case relating to this building? Will walks to exam room two, learning that the door is now mysteriously unlocked. There's a key labeled document room inside. Will returns to the back room, asking Keith about the building. He gets confirmation that it's a mental hospital that was shut down. A millionaire named Jim Cork bought it and turned it into a homeless shelter for a few years, but it currently sits abandoned once again. Will asks for information on if the story from 15 years ago is true, but Keith refuses to tell the story to someone who might soil themselves after hearing it. Will expresses his worries about this building, with the moving shadows and doors opening on their own. Keith says that the opening doors are because of him, as he borrowed a set of keys for his investigation. However, he didn't unlock exam room too. Keith tells Will that everything is in his head. There are shadows, but that's because it's dark. They aren't moving. Will moves to the document room with his new key. By sheer luck, he finds Pop inside, although he's trapped on top of a shelf currently. Will picks up some tarot cards off the floor before moving a nearby ladder over to Pop. When he climbs it, Pop is once again startled and runs away. Why does he keep running away from his friend? On top of the shelf, Will finds a tabloid discussing an event known as the Happy Murders, which is an incident that forced the homeless shelter to close 15 years ago. One day, a priest noticed that the shelter's residents were acting suspiciously. Soon after, five corpses were found scattered throughout the building, each with a different cause of death. The one common trait between the deaths was that each body was suspended by rope. Five residents confessed to the crimes, all with varying motives, yet none mentioned the ropes. The autopsies revealed that the freshest body was from a few days ago while the oldest was from weeks ago, yet none of the residents said anything about the bodies. All five killers gave the same final comment. Now, I've finally become happy. After the incident, the millionaire immediately shut the shelter down, with all of the residents being forced to move to new locations. The door on the left side of the lobby has opened up, so Will steps inside. There's another map on the wall, this one with even more rooms to explore than in the first building. In the corner, there's a pot with a headless doll inside. It's completely tied up using a material that appears to be hair. Someone suddenly approaches Will from behind. It's Sophie, and she seems to know Will's name now. Sophie wants him to follow her away from here so he doesn't catch a cold, but Will is resistant. He's still freaked out after she seemed to recognize him at the cafe, and her sudden knowledge of his name isn't helping with that. Sophie reveals that she got the information from David, who's a close friend of hers. She apparently recognized Will because of how much he looks like David and immediately called to tell him. She learned that he's been worried sick about Will going missing, and Sophie decided to go help look for him. A truck driver reported that a kid was seen going into the woods, so Sophie went in to investigate. So 
Sophie quite literally drags Will out of the building so she can bring him back to David, but he stops her by revealing that his friend went missing inside. He neglects to mention that his friend is a rat, so Sophie decides to help look, thinking that they're trying to find another child. The duo keep exploring, finding another, more intact doll on the floor, as well as a note mentioning that Dr. Dennis Sinier is taking a long vacation to recuperate. Will and Sophie stumble upon a room being occupied by Keith. Sophie and Keith quickly catch up, explaining why they're both here. Will is shocked to learn that they already know each other. Keith recommends that the kids go home, to which Sophie agrees. Before they leave, Will asks if Keith will grab a toolbox for them from the top shelf. He opens it up, finding a hammer, a crowbar, and a screwdriver. Will asks how Sophie and Keith know each other, prompting Sophie to explain that she was saved by him during an incident a while back. She doesn't elaborate on the events of the Boogeyman, but she does tell Will that Keith is currently a client for Sophie's father. It sounds like Keith is making sure that he has a Will and Testament in order. Will asks Sophie if Keith is a bad guy. She tells him that he's not a bad guy, but he's not exactly a good guy either. It sounds like he still pokes fun at her quite frequently, and she does not appreciate that. The two move upwards, finding a book detailing the story of the boy who cried wolf. In a room to the left, there's a crudely drawn sequel to this tale, presumably made by someone at the mental hospital. In this story, the shepherd boy hears the wolves talking about attacking the village. Then, he does nothing to stop them. Since he didn't warn the villagers, they are all torn apart and eaten by the pack of wolves. The boy cheers as they die, overjoyed at the villagers getting what they deserved for not listening to him. Nearby is another piece of paper labeled A Conversation with Lisa Gardner. This transcript documents a conversation with the young girl who drew the rework of the story. The employee speaking to her asks why the villagers died. Wasn't the boy the one who did something? Lisa replies that adults lie all the time too. It seems like she has some lingering mistrust for an adult in her life, and they must have been quite neglectful of her education too, since her arguments are one of the dumbest things I've seen outside of a comment section in a long time. Lisa says that there are four villagers that are still on the run, but she hopes that they get eaten by wolves soon too. She wants all the bad grown-ups to go away so that kids can do whatever they want. Will and Sophie keep exploring. Will thinks he sees a shadow moving once again, freaking Sophie out. When they take a closer look, they find yet another doll under the covers of a bed. In a nearby employee area, they find an employee's diary. It seems that the patient in room 2103 is the one that drove Dr. Dennis Sinier to take a vacation, and because of this, they're being moved to building 3. Will and Sophie return to the main floor of building 2, noticing that the doll in the pot from earlier is completely missing. A shadow shadowy figure enters a door to the north, so the duo follow it. Inside is another one of the dolls that keep appearing around this building. This is the introduction to a very disturbing puzzle. Remember the room with the story of the boy who cried wolf? Scattered around it are dolls that have their stomachs cut open. Will and Sophie are supposed to locate all of the dolls that they've been stumbling across on their journey, cutting open the stomachs of those as well. As they look around, they stumble upon a bathroom stall with long strands of hair poking out from underneath the door. When they approach it, the hair slithers out of sight. Inside the stall, the headless doll from before sits in the toilet, still tied up with hair. Sophie and Will ignore the doll for now. Anything manipulating hair like that has to be bad news. They find the final doll underneath the grate in a different bathroom. They lift up the grate with a crowbar, snapping the tool in half but allowing access to the toy. They cut open its stomach, but nothing happens. There's a locked gate across from the bathroom that Will tried to open earlier to no avail. If he tries again after cutting the dolls, it's still locked, but this time Sophie helps him out and it opens easily for her. Why doesn't she help until after they mutilate a bunch of dolls? No idea. Why does it only open for Sophie? We'll get to that later. With the gate now opened, there's a new room to explore. Will spots a group of shadows sitting around a table and screams. Sophie didn't see anything and accuses Will of trying to scare her. When Will tells her he thinks that the shadows are ghosts, both of them freak out and run away to go get Keith. They both start rapidly screeching at him until he tells them to shut up. Both share the same story about seeing ghosts, but Keith doesn't believe it for a second. He doesn't believe in fairies, and he sure as hell doesn't believe in ghosts. The kids leave and return to the haunted room, taking a closer look at the table in the center. There's a cloth covered in a blanket of dust except for three card-shaped holes. Sophie recognizes this as a setup used for tarot readings, a topic she's quite familiar with because of her friend Anne. Will grabs the second part of the map to building two from the wall while Sophie notices that he has tarot cards with him. She gives an explanation of each of the cards that he has. She notices that he also has a tarot card of the hanged man. He says someone gave it to him, but he claims he doesn't remember who. Will tries to move past the table and through the next doorway, but stops dead in his tracks. That door doorway is causing him to feel a deep dread in his stomach, and he doesn't want to get any closer. This puzzle requires you to look at the dusty notebook from earlier. The message inside references many of the meanings behind the tarot cards that Sophie explained. Will places down three of the cards so that they convey the same meaning as the message within the notebook. Upon doing this, the feeling of dread leaves Will, allowing the two to move forward. They begin looking around the rest of building two. It's full of bedrooms, presumably for the mental hospital patients. Down the hallway, more hair pours from beneath a door. The headless doll sits inside of a bathtub behind it. Sophie doesn't want to believe that it's the same doll to prevent herself from
from panicking. To the south of the floor they're on, Will hears a scream from behind a door. Inside the room, there's a wooden box crafted to look like a six-sided die as well as a note on the ground. The note shows an assortment of diagrams with marked segments. This doesn't have a concrete meaning for right now, but keep it in mind for later. Sophie and Will head up the staircase to the left to get to the next floor of the patient rooms. There's a large section of rotted wood in the wall that Will tears apart with his hammer, breaking it just like the crowbar. There's a hole in the ceiling that they can't reach on their own, so they stack a table and chair underneath so they can clamber up. There's a massive hole in the wall of the bathroom that leads to the third floor housing. One of the doors on the right side is already propped open. Inside is a box with a four-digit combination lock as well as a photo on the wall. It's quite lewd and I don't want to risk showing it, so I'm just going to replace it with a photo that Aaron requested. To find the code to the security box, Will needs to look at this photo four times. Sophie will then call him a perv. He looks at it again, noticing a code written on the back of the photo. This is the second time that we've gotten a puzzle where things just kind of happen for no reason, which is really disappointing when compared to the rest of the series. The Strange Man anthology almost always has puzzles that make total sense from front to back. The dolls getting cut up had no connection to that gate. What if opening them all would have resulted in finding a key that unlocked the gate? That would have made way more sense. The creator has stated that she intended one interpretation of Sophie being able to open the gate but will not being able to do so is Will's fear causing him to mistake things. To keep that scene in for the sake of the story while still allowing the puzzle to make more sense through the use of a key in the stomach, how about we make it so that any other door in the entire building has this issue instead, and it's immediately resolved by Sophie, just like in the normal cutscene. We could even throw in a second door between the gate and the next room and have it happen right there. Then the pacing would be exactly the same. And what if the code that Will finds on the photo was hidden inside the photo itself with some light markings of each number scattered around in the back? Background. Then it would have made sense why when he keeps looking at it, he eventually notices a clue. I don't really see a need to emphasize the perversion of a hormonal teenager here. They open the lockbox, finding a black notebook with the name George Schmid written on it. This has to be the notebook that Ed was looking for earlier. Will notices and follows the sound of Pop squeaking, allowing him to find the dining hall. He picks up his friend, thanking Sophie for all her help finding him. When he reveals that Pop is a rap, Sophie screams in fear. This terrifies the rodent, prompting Pop to run away once again. She quickly tries to recover in an attempt to not offend Will, but he's already upset, telling her to get away from him and leave him be. After all, he's just the freak kid with the rat, right? As Sophie leaves, Will notices a doll resting on her back. He recognizes it immediately, associating it with the name Murdoch. We enter a flashback showing a younger Will spending time at school. His teacher is upset at him for throwing a ball at a classmate, but Will deflects the blame by saying that it wasn't him. It was Captain Murdoch. Will is forced to stay inside during recess where Captain Murdoch appears. He claims that he threw the ball for Will's sake because the kid he threw the ball at doesn't really like him. He looks down on him, always smiling and laughing behind his back. He shouldn't trust anyone else. Not classmates, not teachers, only Captain Murdoch. Everyone calls Will a weirdo behind his back, but Murdoch and the others will never do that. Those are his real friends. But who are the others he's talking about? We cut back to present day with Will immediately regretting his actions. He pushed Sophie away just like Captain Murdoch used to, all because he was so scared of being rejected for being friends with Pop. This here is where Will makes one of the most important decisions in the game. He has to choose between going after Sophie and apologizing or just waiting for her to leave. This event is on a timer, and you only have a few seconds to choose. Your choice will dictate which of the endings that you get. The finale has four different endings, three bad and one good. There's technically a modified version of the good ending with extra scenes, but I really don't think it's worth going out of your way to replay the entire game for. This choice branches us down the path of either bad end one and good end one, or bad ends two and three. I'm going to throw down an extra save file here so I can cover all of them. To start with bad end one, we aren't going to be going after Sophie. Will spends some time in silence, eventually making a realization. The room that he's in mirrors one of the diagrams that he saw on the piece of paper from earlier. He takes a look at the table matching the position of the marked circle on the paper, locating part of a note tape to the bottom. It's clearly a torn piece of a larger note, and it reads Roll 35. Maybe it has something to do with the dice. Will walks to the right, finding a kitchen with a side room. He enters said side room, running into Ed taking a breather in the corner. He asks how Ed managed to get in here without walking past, prompting the man to reveal that he knows this building like the back of his hand. Secret passages included. Will hands over the black notebook to an ecstatic Ed. Supposedly it belongs to someone he knew from a long time ago, this George Schmidt guy. Will learns that about 15 years ago, Ed lived at the homeless shelter for about a year. His father was a drunkard and his mother was dead, so what other choice did he have? He learned from a priest that there was a place they could stay for free. That's where he met George and learned about that notebook. Ed can tell that something happened to Will. The boy confides in his new friend about what happened with Sophie and Pop. Ed assures him that they'll make up because he can tell that Will is a nice kid.
Will asks Ed to come with him, but Ed is currently busy with other work. That notebook has some kind of method that allows him to make progress on something. He doesn't elaborate, making Will promise to show him the talking rat once he finds him. Before he can go, Will asks Ed about the happy murder, since he lived there during the event. Ed doesn't really have anything of substance to say, and he quickly leaves. There's another elevator shaft in the corner, this time with a gate secured by screws. Will uses his screwdriver to remove the barricade, climbing into the elevator shaft. He moves downward, revealing a hallway into an entirely different section of the building. To the left is a boiler room of sorts with a large pool of water in the middle and a valve at the bottom. A water tank sits in the corner. A ladder leads to the top of it, which Will climbs. To his dismay, the headless doll waits there for him. Will climbs back down, quickly trying to leave the room. He reaches for the door handle only to find it covered in hair. He jumps back, falling directly into the pool of water. Ugh, this water looks freaking disgusting. But you know what you can add to water to improve it? Today's sponsor, Gamersups. Gamersups specializes in making delicious beverages for your consumption. Each scoop of their energy formula contains 100 milligrams of caffeine to keep you energized. I wonder who could use some extra energy right now, hmm, Will? Drowning little bit. The energy formula is keto-friendly and chock-full of vitamins to keep yourself healthy. If you're more of a tea person like myself, then they even have you covered there. Finally, if you're looking for something with more snacking potential, Gamersups is here to provide. They have literally the most delicious protein bars that I have ever had the pleasure of trying. They have a ton of new flavors, including peanut butter, which I would highly recommend you try out. If any of that sounded interesting to you, you can directly help support the channel by using code Ben again at checkout to get 10% off your order. Wait, Will's still drowning. Keith hears a loud splash, sprinting into the tank to rescue Will before he drowns. He even lights up a fire to help warm Will up. Keith isn't going to force Will to leave without Pop, but Will is losing hope. Pop keeps running away. What if he hates Will now? Keith shares a story of losing his only pet as a child, telling Will that he shouldn't give up on his search. Keith agrees not to call the police or Will's school until Pop is found. He asks Will to keep an eye out for a ring while searching. He usually wears two, one platinum and one gold, with the gold one being missing. Before Will leaves, he checks out the four lockers in the corner of the room, since they match the diagram on his paper. Sure enough, the marked rectangle on the diagram indicates another part of the note he's been collecting. This piece reads, V61. Will keeps exploring the corridor, finding a door that leads outside. There's a drain underneath a pipe, presumably connected to the boiler room. If Will can find something to put over the drain as a catcher, he might be able to turn the valve in that room and flush the pipes until Keith's ring falls out. For now, Will explores the rest of the hallway. At the end, there's a secondary elevator shaft. He climbs up the ladder, opening the elevator and stepping inside. This is the elevator that was locked earlier with a key in the back. Sure enough, Will finds the key to the library here and takes it with him. Will returns to the boiler room, grabbing the headless doll and taking it with him. If it's with him, he should be able to keep an eye on it so he doesn't scare himself again. Will heads back up to the kitchen, spotting a sieve and taking it with him. This is the perfect item to catch the ring since the water will pass right through it. Will places the sieve on the drain, turning the valve and retrieving the ring scattered among other debris. He heads upstairs to return it to a grateful key. Will asks him about the ring. It's fairly misshapen. Turns out that he made it with his son. The kid wanted to make a ring for his mom on Mother's Day, and they messed up pretty badly on their first attempt. They remade it and gave her the nice one, with Keith taking the misshapen one for himself, like a good luck charm. It's too big even for him, hence why it fell off. Will asks how old Keith's son is, learning that he died in a traffic accident years ago, but that he would have been around 10 years old now. Will says that his father died too, from heart failure. It's a rough attempt at comforting Keith, but the detective appreciates it nonetheless. Will next locates the library, using his key to unlock it and look around. The room is entirely empty, at least for right now. Unfamiliar footsteps are coming down from the hallway, and Will needs to hide. In this section, a shadowy figure will enter the room and begin looking around for Will. I know you can successfully hide from him since there's a steam achievement for it, but I didn't manage to do it during my two attempts. The figure is a man with glasses who begins to scream at Will, demanding to know who he is and what he's doing here. Upon hearing the commotion, Keith enters the room. He identifies the man as Robert. Robert is supposed to be staying at the hotel with a subordinate had assigned to guard him, but that clearly did not happen. The two seem to agree that they need to have a chat in private, sending Will off in the hallway while they have a talk. It seems like Robert is looking for someone, and Will suspects that it might be Ed. For right now, it seems like he'll have to search for Pop elsewhere. One of the only places Will has yet to explore is the basement, as the staircase is blocked off by a pile of sandbags. Will returns to them, successfully managing to climb over the pile. One of the rooms in the basement appears to be a staff quarters with labeled beds and desks, while the other one is a locker room. Will enters the locker room first, realizing that it is a layout matching the final diagram on his paper. He opens the marked locker, revealing the final piece. When assembled, it reads, Roll the dice, 356142. Before Will can do 
anything with this information, Robert enters the room and strikes up a conversation. He apologizes for scaring Will, asking him why he's here. Will explains that he was separated from his friend and is trying to find them. Robert advises him to give up soon, as the snow outside is intensifying. He asks Will about his connection to Keith, although there isn't really anything to talk about. Apparently, Keith approached Robert a few days ago regarding the investigation of a murder that took place one week prior. Robert insists that he isn't the culprit, although Keith is admittedly still suspicious of him. A man was killed in his apartment. Three days later, the odor caused by the decaying body grew bad enough for the owner to investigate. Robert claims that he doesn't know who the victim is, as the detectives refuse to reveal that information. Will asks him why he's here in the first place. Robert used to live here when the mental hospital was turned into a homeless shelter. He was very young when he was a resident, and he returned today to visit some past memories. Will doesn't believe this story for a second. Robert reminds the boy to hurry up and find his friend soon. Will thinks aloud, realizing that he should probably warn Ed of the impending weather. Robert turns on his heel, grabbing Will by the throat and interrogating him. How the hell does he know who Ed is? Has he spoken to him? Pop runs into the room, scaring Robert. The man stomps the rat into a puddle. Will enters a fury throwing himself at Robert and threatening to murder him. Keith enters the room, breaking up the fight and restraining Will. The boy breaks down, sobbing over the loss of his only friend. Will blames himself fully. Keith takes a closer look at the corpse, quickly realizing that this rat doesn't have a crooked leg or missing fur. It isn't Pop. He covers the body with a cloth, reassuring Will that his friend is safe and sound. Will asks if Robert is a killer, but Keith tells him that Robert is a victim before leaving. Will grabs the wooden box shaped like a die, rotating it to input the code from the note he assembled. It pops open, revealing an envelope containing a letter as well as a name tag for Sergio Bowers. In the letter, Sergio reveals that he used to work in Building 3, but is now resigning. He thanks the recipient for showing him kindness and allowing him to swap locations. Sergio was despised in Building 4, especially by a patient named Kenny. Apparently, employees aren't allowed to give gifts, so Sergio leaves behind his name tag in the hopes of being remembered. Across the hall is the staff quarters. There's a stack of crumpled letters in the trash, all of which are written by someone named Alice Stanley. The first one states that she left a present for a doctor on their desk. As the letters go on, Will learns that the doctor immediately threw it away, each and every time, and Alice continued to find and replace it. Eventually, she got rid of the face and made an addition of her own hair. These letters must be from the patient who made Dr. Dennis Sinier take an extended vacation. Will realizes that there's only one doll that he knows that's covered in hair and lacking a face. He removes the headless doll from his bag, placing it atop the desk. After placing the doll down, Will enters the hallway, noticing a shadowy figure on the stairs. It walks away and Will follows. This slow chase continues to the lobby of the building where a door on the second floor is now unlocked. Will uses it, finding himself on a snowy walkway between buildings. Standing there silently is the shadowy figure, a girl with dark hair covering her face. Will recognizes her as Misery, yet another person from his past. We flash back to his schoolyard where he watches Misery crying. He tries to comfort her, agreeing to keep her company until she isn't sad anymore. He wonders if she's lonely, telling her that he's lonely too because everyone avoids him. He decides to name her Misery. She doesn't stop crying prompting Will to admit that even when they're together, they're alone. Back in the present, Will is worried about this appearance. He hasn't seen many of these people in years, yet here they all are at this abandoned hospital. Mime, Murdoch, and Misery. He stops seeing them as soon as he met Pop. Will speeds up, even more determined to find his friend. He enters the next building, locating a room with some towels as well as a map. The map is of a location called Sunnyside, which was confiscated from room 3202. On the back, a patient reminisces about many different locations in that town, wishing to one day return and live the life that they used to. He exits the room, finding a map of Building 3. It seems he was just in the staff room. He moves to the kitchen, finding a notebook as well as some red writing on the floor. The notebook is a diary, detailing the activities of some of the patients. The patient in 3202 has been drawing all over the floors, while the patient in 3408 has been freaking out over a feeling of being watched. The employee taped up the bars in 3408 to act as some kind of curtain, but the patient keeps propping up their chair next to the bars and staring out in fear, insisting that the watching continues. Will finds two more drawings in this building, one in the showers and one in the room to the south. He even finds the taped up cell, although whenever he tries to walk past, he feels as though he's being watched. There are two puzzles to solve here, both of which are intrinsically tied to the patients documented in the employee diary. To solve 3202's puzzle, Will needs to find the three places referenced in the map of Sunnyside. The drawings on the floor are all locations on that map. When Will enters cell 3202, a shadowy person will begin to follow him around the building. He examines each of the drawings in chronological order. After this, Will's flashlight begins to flicker, with the shadow of a dog circling him and claiming that he needs to find Pop as he can't do anything by himself. This is Billy, another one of Will's childhood friends. He met the dog at a hospital while his mother was discussing his imaginary friends with a doctor. Billy can talk just like Pop, although he refuses to talk to anyone but Will. To prove that he's a friend, he decides to tell Will a secret. He tells Will that his owner isn't 
isn't a very good person. He mistreats Billy, frequently forgetting to feed him. He's also unfaithful in his marriage, bringing a mistress to the office regularly. Billy makes sure that Will knows that animals never lie, unlike humans. During Will's meeting with the doctor, he refuses to cooperate, calling him a bad man. When the doctor asks why, Will reveals the secrets told to him by Billy. Will attacks the man, although he's quickly overpowered and thrown into the wall. Will leaves the hospital, listening to one final monologue from Billy. One day, he will meet an animal who knows him well. When this happens, he must follow him. Will denies that the shadow is Billy. The dog was so old that he was on the brink of death when Will was a child, so there's no way he's still alive now, right? To solve 3408's puzzle, Will needs to replicate what the patient was experiencing. He moves the chair over to the bars as described, taking a look through the tape. Some unfortunately placed gaps in that tape seem to be what caused the patient so much trouble. Through them, the poster across the hallway is mostly covered up. The only remaining visible words read out, everyone is watching you. Yikes. Will tears down the poster, immediately dispelling the feeling of being watched from the hallway. This allows him to move past the cell where another snowy walkway is present. Will takes a moment to reflect on his life, on how similar he is to all of the patients. What's gonna happen to him? That's when Keith stumbles upon him. What are you doing out here? You found your rat yet? You said earlier about how Pop could talk. Do you actually think that? I should have never told you that. I already knew you wouldn't believe me. That's how it's been for a long time. I see animals talking and things others don't see. But no one's ever believed me. The truth is all animals can talk, but no one believes them, so they don't. Who told you that? Old Billy. An old, skinny dog at my counselor's place. Won't talk as nobody will believe it, huh? Sounds like somebody I know. So, what started it? Huh? Animals talking, seeing weird stuff. Was there something that started it all off? What started it? It was the hanged man. Oh yeah? Ugh, enough! The more I say, the more you'll think I'm nuts. Well, suppose you might fall under that category. When I was a kid, I judged a lot by what's visible. This person looks good. This person's athletic. This person's smart. The seeds of imagination get trimmed as soon as they bud, because in a small community, they just get in the way. Not many people can grow them right. If you can get a good flower to bloom, that could be a big advantage to you. Nothing to moan and groan over. Just stop it! Don't talk like you understand. You're just saying you don't believe me either, right? Sure, I'm not gonna believe you. But I do happen to think it's very interesting. Something wrong with that? I sort of get what you're saying, but... Because of my weirdness, people suspect Mom of treating me badly. I don't want to trouble her anymore. What do you think parents are for? They act like stepping stones for their kids. If you can make her smile someday, it's fine. How about you give up your rat search for today? It's only going to get darker. Besides, David's worried about you. No, he's not. Like he could be worried about me. What's that supposed to mean? I'm not his cousin. I'm David's little brother. It's just our father who's the same, but... For a long time, I never knew, but my mom was on the phone the other day. Mr. Hoover, please, just leave it be. It's all on me. No, I didn't know. But I found out about you later. I couldn't do anything. And I feel terrible about what happened to your mother. Will has nothing to do with this, alright? Please, don't say anything to him.
He loved his father. I don't want to disillusion him. Mom? Will! S sorry about that. It's time to eat, isn't it? I'll start getting it ready. found out by reading Dad's diary. After Mom got pregnant with me, he divorced David's mom. Mom never knew Dad had another family until he died. He kept it a secret the whole time. There were a lot of photos kept in the diary. Photos of David and his mom. He wrote about a lot of old memories and things, too. He also wrote, I regret abandoning my family. Whenever I meet him, David won't even look at me. I doubt I'll ever be forgiven for abandoning my frail wife and my middle school-aged son. The diary also had a letter in it. The letter came with the hangman card and said, You're a demon child. So that's that letter you have? I'm sure this letter didn't come from Dad. It must have been addressed to me and he hid it. After all, I stole Dad away from David. It's all because of me. I ruined David's family. So you think it was David who wrote that letter? And David was the one who called and made your mom cry? N no not necessarily. It's just I can't think of any other possibility. Mom is always cheerful and tough, but she was crying. If mom's being threatened by somebody, I'm not able to protect her. Pop tried to stop me. He said, What good will it do to go? What can you even do? But I just couldn't stand it. Mom had David's address written down, so I used that to... Uh-huh. Well, you didn't have to lie and say you were his cousin. David was the one who said that. After I broke some merchandise at a fishing shop and he got called in. Eh? What'd you do that for? Dad liked to fish. He used to take me along. I was lost and wandered into a fishing shop. I saw the same fishing rod Dad used to have. When I thought of how Mom was suffering because of Dad, before I knew it, I was stomping it to pieces. I came to apologize to David, to say I'm sorry for messing up his family. And yeah, I went and did that and caused him more trouble. So I ended up just running away. Why am I such a coward? I don't know what I should do anymore. Well, not to stomp all over your determination, but I don't think the letter you've got was written by David. That isn't David's writing. And at least in my opinion, he doesn't have the guts to threaten others. He's stupidly good-natured. On top of that, you say David called your mom, but you didn't hear the conversation, right? Isn't it jumping the gun to say he's threatening her? Then this letter... Whatever it was that led you here, you came to talk to David, right? And David could have pretended you were a stranger, but he didn't. He decided to take you with him. He must have wanted to talk to you. In which case, you ought to meet him properly. If you think you've troubled him, apologize for it. You're only a real coward if you give up now. There's one other person I need to apologize to. Who's that? The owner of the fishing shop. He was too scared and nervous, so I never apologized for breaking the merchandise. Then you'd better do that. Yeah. I'll be heading out after a little more searching. 
you should consider the same. If you really want to keep going, there's always tomorrow. See you. Keith! Um, Keith, was your son important to you? <laughs> yeah, best guy in the world. I still think so now. I wouldn't call your old man's decision right or wrong. Either way, it hurt people, and he regretted it himself. Putting yourself through pain might seem irrational to you, but that's the way a lot of things are. If you butt at everyone, it'll be hard to live. What I can say is, don't grovel. Your old man didn't make his decision for you to do that. It was just his way of settling things. Stick out your chest and don't lose sight of your goal. You didn't come all this way to cry and say, it's my fault, did you? Will stands up, resolving to find Pop, leave this place, and talk to David. He moves to the next building. A piece of rubble immediately falls from the ceiling. This building isn't as stable as the other ones. Will snags a map for building 4 from the wall. There are strange red stains on some of the walls that are almost human-shaped. There are lots of patient rooms here, but not like the ones in the rest of the hospital. They're padded cells. As Will progresses, he has a vision of a red hand reaching out for him. Because of this, he's unwilling to progress. This puzzle is an interesting one, and it requires Will to investigate the dining hall in this building. There's a picture on the wall drawn by a boy named Kenny. It seems that he likes to shake hands with good people. But doesn't that sound familiar? Remember the note we found of the employee Sergio being hated by a patient named Kenny in Building 4? He knew Kenny hated him because he would always shrivel away from Sergio, but he would shake everyone else's hands. The vision of a hand in the hallway is caused by Kenny. To progress, Will needs to put on Sergio's name tag from the wooden box. This will prevent Kenny from wanting to shake Will's hand, allowing him to pass through. Upstairs, one of the cell doors is open. Inside is a note claiming that demons are coming. From the shower room, the hallway, and even in this cell. Until they're stopped, Will cannot progress. There's a locked gate at the end of the hallway that he can't pass through. To solve this puzzle, Will needs to use the can of spray paint he got at the very start of the game. This time, instead of marking his place in an infinite hallway, Will needs to use this paint to cover up each of the three red silhouettes on the walls. Once this is complete, a new cutscene will play when Will interacts with the gate at the end of the hallway. A piece of debris falls from the ceiling. Will dodges to the left, landing inside one of the padded cells. Unfortunately, the door closes behind him, locking him inside. Will starts to panic. What is he gonna do? He's completely stuck with no way out, and no matter how much he screams for Keith, no one comes. The hanged man card falls to the floor, prompting Will to think about the first time he starts started seeing unusual things. As a child, he saw a man suspended from a tree. He was too young to understand what he was seeing. But then the man spoke to him. He gives a philosophical monologue about his choice, but it goes right over Will's head. Despite this, he wants to come back again sometime and listen more. The man says that Will can visit him anytime, and that he'll be waiting. The next time Will went to visit his new friend, the man was gone, replaced by dozens of flowers. After that day, that's when Will started to see things. Mime, Murdoch, Misery, Billy, and even Pop. Will knows that Pop can't actually speak, he just doesn't want to admit it. Because if he does so, he has to acknowledge that something is wrong with him. Not only that, he would lose his closest friend. Will reflects on it all, on how nobody can see his friends. Are they even real? The man in the woods certainly was, but there's no way that he actually spoke. The only one who ever listened and understood was his father, but he turned out to be a bad person. Will thinks back on what the man in the woods meant. As you grow older and mature, you start to see the dark truth behind normal everyday things. You see the true evil in the world. Will wants someone to guide him, to tell him what to do so he can just be a normal kid and live a happy life. But he can't, because he's the demon child that ruined David's family. Will snaps out of it. He stops crying. Nobody is coming to save him. He has to do it himself. Will grabs the hand man card, folding it into an L shape and using it to pick the lock of the broken door by pushing the bolt out of the way. Will did it. He escaped. This is the first step towards independence. The door is still locked, so Will returns to the main floor of Building 4. He hears a noise from the dining hall, stepping inside and finding Robert. Robert is acting suspiciously, claiming that he wants to apologize to Will for what he did to Pop and for getting so physically aggressive. He also tells Will to keep away from Keith. Will lets him know that it turned out to be a different rat, so he doesn't need to apologize. Robert offers to help look for Pop, but Will refuses. He doesn't want to be around a liar. He calls Robert out on his deceptions. He's not here for nostalgia, he's here to find someone. Robert grabbed Will after the boy mentioned Ed. Even now, he's still looking around. Will defends Keith, claiming that he seems like the one person who will actually look him in the eye and talk to him like a person. Then, Robert snaps. He isn't lying because he wants to. Why did all this happen to him? 
His life was almost normal. He managed to escape a life on the streets. Robert curses his father, shaking aggressively. Keith enters the room, calling for Will to get away as quickly as he can. Unfortunately, Will is paralyzed with fear, allowing Robert to grab him. He holds Will next to the hole in the floor, demanding that Keith get rid of his gun. Keith tosses it to the floor, but this doesn't satisfy Robert. The gun is kicked into the hole as Robert continues to panic. He insists that he didn't kill his father, no matter how much he hated him. The murder Keith was investigating was the murder of Robert's father? Keith insists that they don't suspect him. The only reason Robert was assigned a guard was for his own safety. The murderer might have had something against the entire family, and Robert could have been the next victim. Keith reminds Robert that he has a family of his own to take care of now. He can't go around threatening children. Robert begs Keith to let his brother Ed go. Robert insists that Ed isn't the kind of person to kill someone. He's gentle, and he loves animals and he's just all around a good person. He claims that the one who should have had the right to kill their father was Ed. His terrible stutter is all because of the beatings that he endured. Keith insists that he's not in charge of judging Ed, only catching him. If he's really innocent, that will be proven in court. Besides, would letting him go really bring Ed any happiness? Being forced to live on the run for the rest of his life under suspicion of killing his own father? Robert wants to be left alone. He leaves the room. Will tries to get some more information from Keith. Robert's father was killed? And Ed is his brother? Keith refuses to give any more information. He insists that Will should leave soon, but realizes the futility of the request, leaving the boy to continue his search for the rat. Will continues to think. Ed couldn't have done it, right? He's so nice. He never could have killed someone else, could he? This is where Will makes the second and final ending influencing decision. Here he can choose between searching for and returning Keith's gun or not. Since we're starting with Bad End 1, Will doesn't look for the gun, instead rushing to follow Keith. Will makes his way to the padded cells, flagging down Keith and telling him that he knows Ed and that he's here in the mental hospital. Keith demands to know why Will didn't tell him earlier, but Will brings up a good point. He had no clue Ed was wanted for murder. The two realize that this entire time, Robert has been hiding Ed inside of the mental hospital to avoid the authorities. Keith demands that Will stop his search for Pop and leave immediately. Keith plans to catch Ed on his own, but Will doesn't want to leave him by himself. Unfortunately, Keith can't call for help. His phone was destroyed after saving Will from drowning. Keith insists that he escort Will to the exit, but Will manages to convince him that it's better if they split up so Keith can catch Ed faster. As he leaves, Will spots Pop running into the room where Keith's gun is. Will grabs it before chasing Pop into the kitchen. The rat hops down the trash chute with Will soon to follow. He lands in a room full of garbage, wading through it in search of an exit. And when he finally finds a door, he can hear voices on the other side. It's Robert and Ed. This is your final spoiler warning. I'm going to cover each of the game's four endings. If you just want to hear my final thoughts before deciding if you want to pick up the game for yourself, please skip to the timestamp on screen right now. Didn't I tell you to hide over there? Why did you go all moving around? Sorry, Rob. I was looking for something. This right here, it's Mr. George's notebook. He showed it to you too, right? That's neither here nor there. Someone found out you're here, Ed. A boy looking for his friend mentioned you. Y you mean Will? Yes, him. And that detective who's after you is here too. If Will tells him about you, it's all over. Let's get out of here, quickly. First things first, I'll get you to Sunnyside. My colleague Miles has a beachside cabin. It's not a popular area. You can hide a while there. S sorry Rob. I can't leave here just yet. I've got something to do. What are you talking about? What do you have to do? Like I said, it's about this notebook. Will found it for me. Now I n know the method. You remember, right? What Mr. George and everybody said. Y you can't be serious. You're going to take the word of that insane bastard? D don't use bad words. I really hate them. Don't you know that? Shut the hell up! This is not the time! I... I'll go to the police. What was that? Once I'm done with this, I'll turn myself in. I did something wrong, so 
That's the right thing to do. You don't have to do that! Listen, yes, you did something bad. You killed a man. But our old man tormented you for years. He threatened you, beat you, took your money. Who's going to have a problem with his death? R Rob. Thank you for hiding me. Bringing food really helped, too. B but it's okay now. I don't want you to g go through any more trouble for me. Ends with everyone saying you're a killer. I, I'm sorry. You just don't listen, do you? Don't you dare turn yourself in! You don't need to suffer any more for that asshole! R R Rob, stop it! Don't use bad words like that! What's wrong with calling an asshole an asshole? And tell me, are you really taking what George said seriously? Don't believe in the ramblings of a criminal! Don't you know it's all goddamn nonsense? All stained with this shithole shit! S stop it! I told you, I hate it! I hate bad words like that! My head's hurting. I'm the one whose head is hurting. You're all bastards! Every one of you! Wake up, Ed! You're the biggest victim here! Stop! Why do you have to drag us down? Stop it! 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 Rob? Rob! <laughs> it, it happened again! I... I'm sorry, Rob. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what should I do? No, it won't be enough. I'll need to go looking, b b but first... Will, I n need to find Will. Ed has proven to be less stable than anyone could have predicted. He walks off, leaving Will with Robert's corpse. Will is panicking. Why does Ed need him? There's only one door to move through, so Will pushes forward in the hopes that he won't run into Ed. Will. Did, did you find your t talking rat? Uh, oh. I wanted to meet him. Too bad. Ed. Ed. Did you kill your dad? Yeah. Why? I don't know. The, that day I messed up at my job at the Chinese place and got fired. When I got home and told my dad, he got r really mad and hit me. He always hit me, but he said something that time. Why do you make me suffer? Because of you, I'm unhappy. It was a huge shock. I always thought that by working and everything, I was making him happy. But before I knew it, he was on the floor, bloody. My hands were all bloody too. I killed my dad and fell into the pits of unhappiness. I didn't know what to do. I just wanted to 
disappear somewhere. That's when I remembered this place. We were poor and suffered, but I liked how everyone helped each other here. Once I got here, Rob came for me. He figured I must have been hiding here. It seems like Rob was doing all sorts of things to help me escape. He brought me clothes and food. But still, I... I've decided I won't run anymore. Between Z Dad and Rob, I've done unforgivable things. You'll go to the police? Yeah, once I'm done with something important. Something important? What Mr. George taught me. All the homeless people who lived here suffered because we were people who couldn't work and did bad things and betrayed people. The priests said we were punished for our deeds, so we had to do good work for society and make everyone happy. Mr. George said all the years you suffered, those were the best years of your life. B but they weren't happy years. No matter what, we couldn't become happy. After all, for someone to be happy, it takes the sacrifice of other people, especially sinful people. The same way our sacrifice made other people happy. For us to become happy, we had to sacrifice others. That's why Mr. George and the people who agreed with him did that. You mean, the incident fifteen years ago? Right. He called it like a ritual to become happy. Rob dismissed it as just self-destructive. I guess someone like him couldn't understand. Someone who could work hard and crawl out. But they were all arrested, right? The ritual didn't make them happy at all. It's not about good and evil in the law, and it's not about good and evil in society. It's a trial to become happy. It's just the first step to escape from your suffering. It's not the result at the end that's important. It's the process. I don't... I don't get it. I guess you wouldn't. But that's fine. This is our philosophy that only we know. No one else needs to understand it. Will. It was when I met you and heard your words that I was reminded of Mr. George's teachings. When I first saw you in the hall, you were c confessing. I'm a demon child. Because of me, a family fell apart. I'm g glad I met you. I want to be happy, too. Will's life is in danger, and he needs to leave now. He bolts through the hallway, stumbling into Keith on the snowy walkway. Keith asks why Will is still here, prompting Will to tell him everything about the encounter between the brothers. Keith and Will move to leave the building. Before Keith can arrest Ed, he needs to make sure that Will is safe. Before they can make it through Building 3, the ceiling collapses. Keith pushes Will out of the way. When Will finally gets to his feet, there's blood everywhere. Keith is badly hurt. Will runs to grab towels to stop the blood, but by the time he returns, Ed is already 
already there, standing over Keith's unconscious form. He knows that Keith is a detective. He's seen him in magazines before. And in Ed's eyes, Keith is an awful person responsible for a lot of deaths. It's good that he has Keith now, since he now has to atone for Robert's murder, too. When this is all over, he can finally be happy. Ed tells Will to follow him and to not try anything. If Will does anything suspicious, Ed snaps Keith's neck. <laughs> the rope's a little long. Will, do you have a knife or something? Lend it to me. <laughs> now, I'll you up and cut up in your stomach. That's what Mr. George did, right here. It said so in the notebook, too. It m might hurt, but it'll be over quick. J just endure it. Thank you, Will. I'm really glad I met you. Run! <laughs> <coughs> Don't die now. You'll mess up the order. You're supposed to be hanged first. After you're hanged, then... Well, get back here. There's not much point in running. I know this building. I'll catch up quick. So, okay? Come back. Well! Run! Will sprints away, darting into one of the cells and cowering in the corner. Ed's footsteps grow louder, then more distant. Will quickly moves back to check on Keith, only to learn that it's far too late. Keith is dead. That's right. You'll be like this too. It was going to happen sooner or later. Behold, this is what your future is. Cornered by the irrational, driven to death. You will be next. <laughs> no! I won't be hit. Never! I'm... I'm not like you! I won't end up like you! I'll do it! If doing nothing will get me killed, then I'll... You came back. I went pr pretty far looking for you. Well, let's get started. I'm g going to the police station, so I need to be quick. Will? <laughs> Why? Well, it, it hurts. My leg hurts. It hurts. My arm. Stop, Will. D don't shoot. No, Rob, help! Please, no! Help! <laughs> Sir! 
serves you right! This is because you left me no other choice! <laughs> I guess it's that simple. It's kill or be killed. If I don't do anything, then someday I'll be driven into a corner and killed. So then, anyone who corners me, I'll do this to them. That's right. That's what I came here for, isn't it? Anyone who makes me or Mom suffer, I won't give them a chance. I'll get rid of them all. That's what I need to do to live. I'll never, never be a man. David? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have disappeared like that. I wanted to talk about something, but I got too nervous and ran away. But it's okay now. Okay. Thank you. I'll be fine. I won't get lost again. I'll head there now, David. This ending is fascinating. Seeing Will finally break was haunting. The fight was over, yet he kept going, just like Ed. One murderer was replaced by another. The murder of Robert was terrifying, and it was the perfect way to show just how unstable Ed truly was. And introducing someone that Will felt he could trust before taking them away was heartbreaking. We got that ending by allowing Sophie to walk away and by not giving Keith his gun back. To get Bad End 2, we need to go back to our earlier safe state and run after Sophie. Will stops Sophie, apologizing for what he said. He thanks her for helping him look for Pop, claiming that he can handle the rest himself since she doesn't like rats. He promises to go back to David, asking her not to tell David where he is for right now. Sophie is worried about Will's well-being, but she agrees to stay silent. She will wait for a few hours, and then if he doesn't arrive at David's house, she'll come back for him so they can look for Pop together. Sophie makes him promise not to do anything dangerous. The two lock fingers in the world's most sacred bond. A pinky promise. The rest of the game is the same from that point up until the endings. To get Bad End 2, Will needs to head straight for Keith without grabbing his gun. Just like last time. Will talks to Keith, he agrees to leave, Pop appears, Will grabs the gun, Will chases Pop down the trash chute, and the brothers argue on the other side of the door. Who's there? <coughs> you... who are you? Will's friend. Did you hear us talking? I... I didn't hear anything. Don't lie! Let go! Let go of me! R Rob, no violence. She was listening to the whole thing. She knows I was hiding you. And your next hiding place. No! Help! Somebody! Mr. Keith! Mr. Keith! You know that detective too? Rob! Come on! The brothers leave and Will rushes to find Sophie. Her body is crammed in a locker, bruised from both ropes and fists. She's not breathing. Will tries to find Keith, this time without running into Ed. He's a blubbering mess and is completely unable to explain what happened to Sophie. Keith decides to escort Will out before looking for Sophie. The ceiling still crumbles and Keith still gets injured. Will once again leaves to gather towels. Are you... Edward? You're a detective, huh? I saw you in a magazine my father had. You're bleeding a lot. 
My coat's dirty, but it should stop the blood. Don't touch Keith! Will, he's wounded. I said don't touch him! Get away from him! Will? Move! Get out of here! Don't lay a finger on Keith! Will, calm down. Put down the gun. But I need to treat him. Shut up! You damn murderer! You killed Sophie! What? Sophie, she came back here for me. She made that promise with me. Why? Why did you do that to Sophie? You bastard! I'm gonna kill you! Wait, don't fire. That gun's... No, don't shoot. Will, please! Shut up! My hands! My hands! It's okay, Will. Calm down. Whoa! What's going on? Call an ambulance. Get him to a hospital. Why did this happen? The hammer broke when I dropped the gun. I noticed and tried to stop him, but it was too late. I take full responsibility. Detective? Will wants to talk to you. It's all my fault. Sophie came back because I made that promise with her. When Sophie got captured, I was too scared to move. I didn't go save her right away. That's why Sophie died. Sophie's not dead. Huh? She was strangled and lost consciousness. But she's woken up now. She's at another hospital for inspection. Thank goodness! I was so scared. I thought Sophie died because of me. In the end, the only idiot was me. I got the wrong idea and went nuts. I even ended up losing the hand I made our promise with. Now I can't touch anything or write anything or hold hands with anyone. I'm sorry. It was all my fault. Why are you apologizing? Don't apologize. You didn't do anything wrong. It's all my fault. I reap what I sow. Isn't that right? Say something, Keith. Keith, wait! Don't go! Keith! Keith! Will, please calm down. Let go! Let go of me! Keith, come back! Keith! That's why I told you to find him quickly. You can't do anything alone, so going and doing that, you just lost the hands you need to hold anybody else's.
But maybe it's for the best. If you stay in here, you'll be safe. Even on your own. Where's Pop? I want to see Pop. I'm afraid he's passed away. But it's all right. I'm here. Mime and Murdoch and Misery, we're all here with you. Just like old times. You shouldn't look out the window. Don't you remember? Out the window is the woods, and there, the hand man is waiting for you. I think this is the saddest and most shocking ending in the game. The explosion came out of nowhere, and the illustration for it was the most intense thing I've seen in any Uri game. Will's emotions about the loss of his hands is tear-jerking. Listening to him describe everything he'll never be able to do in his lifetime is so ridiculously sad. Hearing both Keith and Will blaming themselves for what happened, and then Keith just leaving halfway through the conversation? It just hurts. Billy's return was definitely a bit confusing, but it'll all be explained when we compile some of the endings with notes from the developer at the end of the video. For now, it's time for Bad End 3. This one requires Will to apologize to Sophie and return Keith's gun. Here, the interaction with Keith goes almost exactly the same until the end where Will gives the weapon back and Keith expresses gratitude. Now that the detective is armed, hopefully there will be a different outcome. Will once again chases Pop down the trash chute and eavesdrops on the brothers. R Rob. Thank you for hiding me. Bringing food really helped, too. B -b but it's okay now. I don't want you to g go through any more trouble for me. And with everyone saying you're a killer, I, I'm sorry. Why did this have to happen to us? It's completely irrational. Ed, please, run away. You're a good man. I don't want you to suffer anymore. I won't run. R Rob, you can run. You're happy now, aren't you? You have a wife? A kid? If I make y you and your family unhappy, I I'll be really sad. I won't t tell anyone you hit me. S so, okay, Rob? Run away. I I want to be happy, too. Well... I wanted to meet your talking rat. For some reason, Sophie didn't show up here. Will heads to the hallway where Ed isn't present. When he gets to the walkway, Will runs into Sophie instead of Keith for some reason. We never actually get an explanation as to why this change is present. Will warns her about there being a killer on the loose in the hospital, and both of them make a run for it. On their way back to the entrance, they run into Ed sitting in the hall. Ed! Is that him? The killer? S sophie don't get in front of me! W will Stay away! Keith! Will, Sophie, get over here. Edward Hayes, do you know who I am? Uh, a detective? That's right. You've been here the whole time? Yes. I see. I didn't think I'd find you here. Everyone thought you were miles away by now. I'm sorry. 
I, I'll go with you. Will you now? That's good to hear. But first, there's something I want to do. Could you wait a little while? Can't do that. You're coming with me now, or else. But... Edward, you understand you've done something wrong. So you know what you should do, right? Right now, put what you have to do ahead of what you want to do. Detective, please tell me something. Can I become happy? I don't know. But if you make up for your crime and work hard, then it's possible. It'll just take time. I... I understand. Will, I... Didn't mean to hide it, but sorry for scaring you. I wish I could have met you a little sooner. Ed? Let's go, Ed. Stop! Don't do this anymore! Hide them. And you're going to help us. Rob! I've made up my mind. I'm not abandoning you ever again. You killed our father because I left you behind. It was all my fault. Ed, escape with me. It'll be hard, but we might be able to get away. If you're going to hell, I'm coming with you. There's a car at the exit of the woods. Let's go, quickly. But first... Rob, don't! I know. Show me your bag. William Morton, huh? You came a long way. What kind of family you got? Parents? Voice box not working? Oh well, no need for you to talk. Just listen. You helped us hide their bodies. Understand that? You're our accomplice. If you go telling anybody about this, I'll chase you to the ends of the earth to kill you. Not just you, your family too. Even if the police get me, whatever it takes, however many years, I'll find you. You think that's irrational? So do I. Irrational things have made me and him suffer all our lives. If you let out this secret, you can consider yourself haunted by them too. Of course I know it's not justified, but what of it? I just can't stand this world anymore. I hate it all so much. I'll just take out anyone who tries to corner us. Be a good grown-up, Will. Keep your mouth shut. If you do, you and your family can live in peace, too. I'm sorry, Will. Hey, kiddo! Sure is snowing today. What's the matter? Lost? Whoa, what's wrong? Hey, get up! Will... Cindy, is it? Seems your son collapsed near the woods. He had his student ID on him, so we contacted the school. But he's pretty weak and won't say a thing.
He's been gone since yesterday. I've been looking for him ever since. Uh, I can't believe he went out this far. Huh, so he ran from home. Well, glad we found him. You're free to head on back now. Why did you disappear like that? Why come to this town? Did you have some business here? You can't say. I've run away from home before, when I was a little girl, you know? There wasn't much reason. I just wanted to see a new world. I hope that's what it was for you too. Mom. I love you. I love you too, honey. I can't tell anyone. If I open my mouth, Mom will be in danger. If I keep it shut, I can go back to life as usual. It's the only thing I can do. Because I'm weak. So that's the only way I can protect Mom. I just ran away from home. That's all I did. That's right. I didn't see anything. And nothing happened. Deep in those woods. I really like Keith's honesty during this ending, and Ed's willingness to change. He really does care about his short-lived friendship with Will and wishes things could have gone another way. And Robert's intrusion was baffling. He shot a detective and a teenager, then emotionally tormented a child, all for his brother's sake. He didn't even consider that his brother would most likely be put into a facility where he could get help for his trauma. Ed could re-enter society, just like Robert did. The decision was completely selfish. He could have had a life being there for his family and making sure his brother got the help that he needed, but he threw it all away. He abandoned his family and ruined Ed's last chance at happiness, all because of his own sick sense of justice regarding the death of his father. The psychological toll that he takes on Will is horrifying to think about. Will isn't knowledgeable enough to realize that he was under duress while helping to move the bodies. Even though Will could go to the authorities at any time and receive nothing but support and protection, he doesn't know that it's an option. Watching a man murder two friends in cold blood before memorizing the information of Will and his family was just too traumatizing. Robert has done irreversible damage to Will's psyche. The close shot of Will's face on the train as he and his mother ride home was really what sells this for me. This isn't a face expressing sadness, it's a face expressing resolve. Resolve to protect his family no matter the cost. I guess he's kind of similar to Robert in that way. That concludes all of the bad endings to this game. To get the good ending, Will cannot go after Sophie. She needs to be far away from this hospital, safe and sound. Then, Will needs to arm Keith. He returns the gun, chases Pop one final time, and eavesdrops on the brothers. This interaction is exactly the same as in Bad End 1. Ed beats Robert to death before running away in tears. Will tries to escape but runs into Ed in the hallway. Keith is injured by the debris and both he and Will are kidnapped by Ed. But this time, Keith has a weapon. It might hurt, but it'll be over quick. J just endure it. Thank you, Will. I'm really glad I met you. Keith! Don't move. I'll untie the rope. Keith! Get up! Come on! What do I do? I need to get away from here. But... What should... What should I do? Ah, oh, jeez. I can't stand to watch this. 
Looks like you've gotten yourself in one heck of a mess while I've been running around, eh, Will? Pop! Please help me! I don't know what I should do! Tell me! Use your head! You can't be relying on me forever! I can't! I can't do anything! Oh, really? You realize if you do nothing, that guy will kill you? I don't want that! Well, you could always just save yourself. No! I definitely don't want Keith being killed! Then you better do something. He'll come back while you're dawdling. Oh, fine. I'll give you a hint. Beat it! Huh? What are you talking about? I can't run away and leave Keith behind. Well, well, well. You're a clumsy coward. Running's your strong suit, right? Just gotta add a little courage to it. I have given you enough hints now. To protect the guy, you gotta run. You get me? I... I see what you're saying. But... If I mess up... I, I know! I'll look for a weapon! Don't even think about it. Sure, even a rat like me can bite back at a cat when he's cornered. But what happens after that? Once you taste blood, you'll do it again. Will, you've been kept up in your room, looking out the window, and you felt like that showed you what the world was, so you despaired. You're scared, afraid that man's hair from the tree outside, wondering if you'll end up like that too. But that window's fogged up. You gotta leave the room on your own two feet, so take the first step. You're not a guy who's taken by delusions and hurts people. Ain't that right? Show him the funky strength of your fight! This really cemented my hatred for Pop. I feel like a life or death situation isn't really the greatest time for a vague and drawn out life lesson. It's not the time for hints. He could have easily just said, Keith needs some time to escape, get Ed's attention, and distract him for as long as you can. But you know what? Whatever. It's fine. It's a stupid rat. We've established that Pop can't actually be talking, so this all just has to be some kind of internal conflict. Will. Keith! Hide somewhere. Look for a chance to get out of here. Don't let Edward find you. But what are you going to do? Once he comes back, he might kill you. You don't have to worry for a grown-up, kid. Think about your own safety. But... Listen. Your father died when you were young. But I know he never wanted you to die like this. So do what I'm telling you. Please. You're right. But I could tell you the same thing. I know your son wouldn't want you to die like this. I'm going to get his attention and lead him away from here. That way he won't come near you. While I do that, you hide. And when you can, get out of this building. Stop. Don't be rash. Keith, thanks for protecting me, again and again. I'm glad I can meet you. Will! Damn it! Don't cry! Stop shaking! You can do this! You gotta do this! I know you can definitely do this. Yeah, show them, Will. Go show them how you're not a useless brat. Will. Hey, asshole! You, you want to kill me, right? Go ahead and try, but I bet you can. Uh, I told you, you shouldn't use bad words. I really hate them. Oh yeah? So what? You think I care what you like or hate? 
I'm not gonna play along with your shitty philosophy. I'm not like you. Will! Y you angry? Just try and catch me! Dumbass! For some reason, this is the only chase in the entire game. It's interesting and fun, but it's not without its flaws. Will needs to run away from Ed without getting caught, but as we established earlier, Ed knows all the secret paths built into the hospital. Because of this, Ed will appear in unexpected locations, startling Will during the chase. This is fortunately really easy to take advantage of. The trigger for each of Ed's appearances is always exactly the same, so if you don't think you can make it to the next room, you can easily return to where you came from and try again while knowing exactly where Ed will spawn. If you try and exit the hospital through the most direct route, Ed manages to predict your movements and take you down, admittedly with some unfair super speed. Because of this, the entire chase is just trial and error. Because of Ed's spawn triggers, you can actually stand still at the start of each room and plan your movements. The rotating perspectives can cause a lot of problems here, since you don't have time to stop and read signs. You just have to try and use the maps to the best of your ability. The one location where I wasn't able to plan out my route as much as I would have liked to is right here. Ed's spawn trigger is right here at this door. Will needs to take the staircase, which only has one tile of clearance for the hallway on the very far right side of the wall. To pass this, you need to know about the staircase's hitbox, hug the right side of the wall, and remember to account for the terrible staircase mechanics in this series where you have to move up, then to the side, over and over again to get up the staircase. This is one of the few times where you can't run back and try again. You have to start all the way from the start of the chase. Once Will gets to the entrance hall, he bolts through the door. He taunts Ed, weaving through the forest. Unfortunately, his luck does not last, and he runs into a dead end. Will. Keith should be long gone by now. I... I told him to run away while I was leading you around. There's no point in just taking me, right? So this is it for you! Ed... I was always uneasy. I was worried I was delusional and nuts. So the fact that you believed me about Pop and understood what I was saying, it made me happy. But it's no good. If you completely go into your own world, you're ultimately going to be all alone. You can't keep living like that. You won't have faith in yourself. I need to get out of the room I've been in. I need to become an adult. Don't you too? Sacrificing someone won't make you happy. Even if it does, you'll definitely regret it someday. Especially when you're as kind as you are. You need to leave that rundown place and shake off those delusions haunting you. Tone for your crimes, Ed. That's what you need now. <laughs> Help me, Will. I don't know what to do anymore. I know there's something wrong with me, but then what should I do? Dad and Rob, they're, they're gone. No one can tell me anymore. Please, listen to what I'm saying. There's no other way. Even if you become happy that way, it'll still just be you. You'll always be all alone. And someday, you'll end up hating yourself. I don't want that at all. I'll never be a hand man. <laughs> 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 Will, are you okay? Sophie! Keith! I... I... You did good. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Does your injury still hurt? Eh, it's better when I'm moving around instead of sitting still. 
Maybe it hurt less if you gave it a little kiss. Not in front of a child, honey. He's not a child anymore. Then, I guess I can't say no. That's right. I'm not a child, so do as you please. So you're awake. How are you feeling? My soul's hurt like hell. No, I'll bet they do. After all that running around. Are you okay? Should I call a doctor? Are you Keith's wife? Yes, I'm Helena. It's nice to meet you. Your mother's on her way here now. You can meet her soon. I'll go tell the doctor he woke up. Thanks. She seems nice. There's no seams about it. She is. Keith, what, what happened with Ed? He confessed to his father's murder. He's being questioned now. Robert's seriously injured, but he's alive. We're waiting for him to regain consciousness. Their trial will be starting soon. You might need to give some testimony. Are you up for it? I'll be okay. I can see what happened. David. Keith, thanks for calling me. You're late. He just woke up now. I'll step out for a second. Take over for me. D David. Um. Uh. Ow! You idiot! What were you thinking? Disappearing without saying a thing. But, I mean... No buts. Do you know how long I was looking for you? I caused you trouble, so... So I thought I shouldn't cause any more. Didn't you realize disappearing would make me worry more? Doing something so conceited and selfish. You're like your father that way. Sorry. I'm sorry. Let's talk a little. And don't run this time. Got it? Okay. Ugh, it's cold. I'll go on ahead. Mom? Sorry for worrying you. You're saying that now? I worry about you every day. I'm glad that I got to have a proper talk with David thanks to you. Though, leaving without a word to me? Not so much. If you make dinner tomorrow, I'll forgive you. I look forward to it. The train's about to leave. Come on, quickly. Will! Sophie! Good, I made it in time. You're leaving already? I decided to go back home for now. Ah, oh, that's good. Did you find Pop? Oh, really? Too bad. I heard about you and David. Did you talk with him? Yeah. What did he say? If it's fine with you, you can think of me as a big brother. I want to get along with you. <laughs> He's so dumb. There's no good reason to have a gloomy guy like me as a little brother. What are you saying? David said that because that's what he wants. Or... Is it because you don't want that? No. It made me really happy. Sophie. Thanks for everything. For helping me out. <laughs> you should really look at people when you thank them. S stop it! Don't touch me, you dummy! 
Sorry to butt in, you two. What is it, Mr. Keith? Will, I brought something you forgot. Couldn't be bringing it into the hospital, naturally. Huh? Pop! I think this guy might understand humans after all. He was acting up, but when I said I'd take him to Will, he settled down. You went looking for him? I was just wandering around during the investigation and caught him in a net. That's all. Why did you have a net on an investigation? Every detective needs one. Don't forget it. Cold out here. David said once it warms up, he wants to go to a baseball game with you. So come back in spring. Give me a call when you come visit. I'll tell you all the good places in town that aren't those creepy woods. Okay. Thank you. I'm really glad you came back to me, Pop. You're hungry, right? Want some cheese? Pop? Hey, Pop. Mom's asleep. You can talk now. You won't talk anymore? I see. Well, it's fine. Whether you talk or not, you're still my friend. That was a really long day. Feels like a lot changed. I'm not even sure what exactly, but I'm sure there's been a really big change. A long time ago you told me, before I parted ways with you, I had to become a real good man. After this, I feel like I've come a little closer. I'm still cowardly, no courage. I don't know what's wrong or right. But still, I'm not a demon child. Even without someone teaching me about the world, I'll be fine. I'll meet lots of people, go lots of places. I'll find it myself. So much snow. I hope spring can come soon. I love getting to see Will and Ed's conflict after the chase. Will is one of the few people who knows what Ed is going through, at least to an extent. The conclusion was really well written. I'm glad that Sophie knew that Will didn't mean what he said and that she was willing to come back with Keith to save him. She was genuinely worried, too. Keith's praise was wholesome and it showed how he's still a little bit awkward with people. I love getting to see Helena again. She was one of my favorites from The Boogeyman and she truly makes Keith a better person. Knowing that Ed was brought into captivity and that Robert is alive is very reassuring. I hope that after Will testifies in court, Ed can get the help that he needs, and Robert will come to understand that this was the right choice. David immediately filled the big brother role perfectly, decking Will even while he's in the hospital because of how worried he was. No matter how many characters they introduce, David will always be my favorite, especially after he was so willing to welcome his half-brother into his life. As much as I dislike Pop, I'm glad he's back. He doesn't speak anymore, but that's for the best. Will doesn't need him to. He's grown a lot and is becoming more independent. This ending is one of my favorites in the entire series, and it really warms my heart. While I still regard The Boogeyman as my favorite in the Strange Men anthology, I absolutely adored the finale. Uri is a masterful storyteller, and I plan to keep an eye on her future releases. She did announce two side games in the series, although there's very little information about them online, and it's been almost seven years, so my hopes aren't exactly high. There's one last thing to look through before I wrap things up. In 2017, Uri put out a tweet stating that for every like she got, she would reveal a hidden detail about one of her games. This got more of a response than expected, and it ended up with her cutting off the deal at 100 facts. The last section was all about the finale. I'm going to read off a few of the facts that I feel are the most important to the story. If you want to read the rest for yourself, I'll leave the page in the description. 
81. The things Will saw as a child were basically imaginary friends. The man in the forest's body and Pop do exist, so strictly speaking, it's not quite that. I take this to mean that Mime, Murdoch, and Misery are all figments of Will's imagination, but that the animals and the man in the woods were real. He imagined pre-existing physical entities that shouldn't be talking as if they were somehow able to do so. This does raise a few questions, like how did Will get information from Billy if he wasn't actually able to convey information? Uri only confirms that Pop and the man in the woods are real, so maybe there was some kind of ghost information with Billy? My personal theory is that Will just unconsciously made these observations. He could physically see that Billy was malnourished so that one isn't too hard. As for the infidelity, Billy draws a lot of attention to the strong smell of perfume in that room. I think that that odor was enough for Will to put two and two together. 83. Mime was born from the fear of something being there in the dark. 84. Murdoch was born from the irritation of being unable to properly get along with others. Even when trying to befriend others, he just gets teased, further isolating him. 85. Misery was born from his sadness due to being alone. She has no relation to Alice Stanley from the hospital, you just see Misery in the hallway because reading Alice's letters reminds Will of his feelings of loneliness. These are interesting insights into why the imaginary friends came to be, but I think the ones about the physical entities are a lot more interesting. 86. Billy reflects lonely Will's desire for someone he can put his absolute trust in, since animals don't lie. Having some paternal elements assigned to him, he sounds a bit controlling sometimes. 87. Pop assumes the role of an ideal father, which Will sought as he was beginning to come to terms with his father's death, so he doesn't get pushy or try and restrict Will's actions like Billy does. He teaches Will lots of things and affirms him. 90. Pop's name comes from Papa, as in father. So those last two kind of weird me out. The entire game I was getting more like irresponsible friend slash brother vibes from Pop. I can't really see him as a father figure in any capacity. He seems too irresponsible for a role like that, and he was even insulting Will by the end of the game just to try and light a fire under him. I don't know, it just feels off. This is of course a 14 year old's idea of what an ideal father is, so uh, maybe it's that? 98. The next game for the series, Spinoff 1, is planned to be a short series serious one. It should be done fairly quickly. 99. Spin-off 2, planned to come after the above, is planned to have some elements of comedy. The content might be tough for some people. Since this was posted in 2017, I don't think there's any hope of us getting these spin-offs anytime soon. But that doesn't mean we should give up entirely. So that's it. After nine months, that's really it for the Strange Men Anthology. I'm not exaggerating when I say this is one of the best game series I think I've ever played. It had its flaws when it came to gameplay, but the majority of the time I understood what I had to do and why. Every single story was incredible. Everything was well written and emotional, which elevated RPG Maker Horror to a level I never thought was possible. I can't believe how lucky I am that this was the first RPG Maker Horror series that I ever played. I truly believe that it's a masterpiece, and I will never be able to do it the justice that it deserves. Now that you've seen it all, do yourself a favor and pick up the games for yourself. They're technically free, but I would highly recommend that you throw some support Uri's way and get them on Steam just for a few dollars. Please take the time to experience these stories firsthand. I guarantee you it'll be worth every second. Thank you all so much for the support throughout the run of this series. I hope to see you all again. Have a great rest of your day.